first of all, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, this race Thank has you. flipped on its head in the past week. Uh, Democrats have gone from, uh, in many cases, despondent to enthused. Uh, the excitement's coming from all over the place. What do you make of it? Um, everybody should be excited. This was, this was an incredible week, and I think it's going to continue. I think there's going to be one surprise after another in terms of how well uh, Vice President Harris is going to do. Uh, this was an excellent move. Uh, uh, Joe Biden did the right thing. He'll, history will remember him for it. And um, and if it results in us having our first woman uh, uh, president, uh, even better. So, uh, yeah, no, I think it's all great. Um, and, and I was listening to your conversation with our state uh, party chair uh, there, uh, Ms. Barnes. And uh, it, uh, you know, the, let me say this. <laughs> Um, I'm not frightened by Donald Trump. Uh, there, there's no reason that he should ever go back into the Oval Office again. We live in a we live in a very different country now, different from even uh, the eight years ago when he was first elected. Elected thanks in part to Michigan mm -hmm. because the in candidate, the Democratic yeah. Party, yes, okay, yes, that bad. Um, the shame is still <laughs> hanging over me, but as a Michigander, but. Uh, the candidate and her campaign made a decision in 2016 to not visit Michigan, to not visit Wisconsin, and we lost Michigan, Wisconsin. Yeah, probably the worst campaign decision at least of the 21st century. Would you sign off on that, Gavin? Yeah, it still blows my mind. Like the other day, I actually had to look that up because you always hear it as a talking point, but I was like, is that actually true? Hillary Clinton literally never went to Wisconsin and Michigan. It is. She never stepped foot there. How the hell like that's that that should be like criminal negligence. She should be prosecuted for giving us all Donald Trump as a country. How dare you squander such an easy election by making such mis obvious mistakes, thinking that you were entitled to these states and their votes. What a complete. She didn't even go to Ann Arbor, man. I, like, I don't expect Hillary Clinton to be walking down eight mile in Detroit, <laughs> but. Yeah, I go go to northern Michigan. That's a that's an aristocratic enclave. Yeah. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, and that was the, the whole difference right there. Mm -hmm. And now any analyst that you look at for this year's uh, election says, and Michelle Goldberg wrote an excellent column in the New York Times. She said, essentially, you lose Michigan, you lose the White mm -hmm. House. Mm -hmm. Critical. We're talking about 300,000 Arab and or Muslim voters in the state of Michigan. Biden won the Arab Muslim vote in Michigan by about more than 60 percent yeah. in 2020. Uh, the last poll I saw from two weeks ago, uh, less than 15 percent of the Arab Muslim vote in Michigan will right. vote. At that we point saw for that in the uncommitted vote vote uh, in the primary. So anyway, I, that's most of like his initial forecasting. They get into the ins and outs of how Kamala Harris can shore up support with the uh, Arab American communities in Michigan, uh, obviously a huge electoral demographic that the Democrats need to hold on to that they need to bring back in. Um, but also they're going to need to reach working class folks. They're going to need to reach minority voters. Kamala Harris has a head start in that capacity because of her identity. I think a lot of people are just going to be excited to have a woman be the president. I think a lot of people are going to be very excited to have a black woman be the president. That is a reality. That is a benefit to her campaign right now. They should exploit that. However, she's going to need to, the rubber's going to need to meet the road at some point. She's going to have to extend an olive branch to the people of Michigan if she wants to win it. Uh, she's going to need to spend time there. I think Michael Moore is forecasting that she's going to be able to get the job done just based on vibes. And that dude knows when the vibes are bad, he was screaming from the rooftops in 2016. Gavin and I, we came to politics a little bit differently than most people do. One, we were both rapidly obsessed with it as young children. Uh, Gavin and I became friends in fifth grade. We started talking a lot about John McCain, Sarah Palin, Barack Obama, the works, right? But we became big fans of Michael Moore through his films through the work that he did as a legendary filmmaker. He hates being called a documentarian, so I won't call him one. Uh, he was like, I have some of the highest grossing films of all time. Don't call me a documentarian. It's not something that you put on in the library. You know what I mean? It's not March of the Penguins. Exactly. <laughs> this is something that you could put on with your friends and enjoy watching, which is what makes him an absolute legend. And yep. 
why he's actually effective in lefty politics. People could take shits on him and be like, he said Michelle Obama should run. He was desperate to not have Donald Trump be our president. Anybody with a rational brain can understand. But in 2016, he put out this movie. Uh, it wasn't one of his feature films, but it was called Michael Moore and Trump Land. Mm -hmm. And he was going all over the country. And he was with guys like Eddie Vedder, you know, uh, a lot of Nirvana fans in the chat. I'm kidding. That was a joke. Uh, you know, uh, he knew the writing was on the wall and he was freaking out about it. He was melting down. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think it's encouraging to have him be like, no, I think Michigan is, I think Michigan's blue this time. Yeah. And even though there are a lot of people who are very disappointed with how Joe Biden's governed, it's not the unique political moment that allowed for Michigan to go red. And it's still obviously crazy that Hillary basically just abandoned it. Yeah, hundred percent. And obviously, you know, if you guys have never seen Michael Moore's first documentary, Roger and me, you might not know just how much he understands the state of Michigan and what's happened to a lot of the areas in Michigan, like Flint. He's from that, Flint. Yeah, the, he's from Flint. Exactly. Um, these areas of the country that at one point were incredibly prosperous economically. You know, there was really uh, a, a thriving middle class, a thriving Main Street. You know, they would do parades every summer. And his film basically documents how all of that went away as soon as General Motors left the community and shipped all of their production overseas for the sake of making it cheaper, right? Talks about the absolute devastation and destruction of that community. And it's, it's you know, it's a hilarious movie in typical Michael Moore fashion, but I genuinely think it's the best film ever made about that phenomena that kind of happened under like the Clinton administration and the NAFTA and stuff. Peanuts, man. Yeah. Anyway, if you guys haven't seen Michael, uh, uh, Roger and me, I definitely think that's like, Easily, I mean, all of his movies are great, but if you just want to understand that whole phenomena of why people in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania turned for Trump and were easily, uh, you know, why he was able to take advantage of them and, and prey on how vulnerable they were with his phony populist rhetoric. I don't think there's a single better movie that, you know, encapsulates that than Roger and me, even though it was made way before the Trump era. Yeah, it's an 89 film, I believe. It's yeah, absolutely crazy. crazy. Um, and I think it also helps will help people understand who Michael Moore is as a man, because he is a true believer in the American system, right? And that's one of the things I look up to about Michael Moore, because sometimes for me, it's hard to believe in the American system. It's hard to believe that you could be a change maker. It's hard to believe that any work in media has value, right? And he always believes and he always keeps pushing and he always, you know, he always meets the moment. I feel like mm -hmm. he might throw junk every once in a while. Everybody got their brain broken when Donald Trump became president. Like, I know I don't think it was a smart strategy for us to run Michelle Obama. I know he was really into that for a while. But the thing about this guy is that he cares so deeply and he's not afraid to eat the half a bowl of shit because he knows it's better than a full bowl of shit. And some people hate that about him. But I also know that he was the loudest and proudest Bernie Sanders supporter when the, when the moment came to that. He was there. Yep. You know what I mean? We saw him live at that Bernie rally. One of the best days of my life, guys. One of the best, most hopeful days of Gavin. I think Gavin and I's, you know, career, but just lives as individuals. Yep. Theater Rapids, Iowa, 2020. We're like a month away from lockdowns. The Chiefs have just won the or uh, yeah, the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl, if I'm not mistaken, yep. Gavin. Yep. And then we go and we drive up vampire weekend plays. We see a insane lineup of people because for guys like me and gavin seeing michael moore and nina turner and bernie sanders speak that's just as good west as, i think Cornel, yeah Cornel, that's just as good as seeing the band play and then the band comes on and plays a bunch of hits it was awesome